Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dina Mashiani. I am the head librarian at the South Campus. On behalf of the UFS Library and Information Services, would like to officially welcome you to the launch of the book by Prof. Gary Oshoff. I'm, I think I'm, am I pronouncing it correctly? Okay. Um, so basically, these uh, book launches, they are aligned with one of our strategic objectives of the library, which is basically to raise awareness and visibility of the research outputs of our scholars. And we don't only um, create that visibility platform, but we also create a platform for engagement as well, so that we can enhance the research outputs or the impact, rather. And I looked up the, the theme for, the, for this month, Heritage Month, and it, it is Heritage and Climate. And based on the snippet or the description of the book, um, it's, it's basically, uh, it, it aligns with, with the theme of, of this month. And it is befitting to launch this book because it contributes to the preservation of heritage. Since we are, we are, we are um, celebrating Heritage Month. And through uh, your, your book, Prof, I think the next coming generation will be able to see our history, will be able to relive our history and, and heritage. And on behalf of the library, uh, um, on, on, on that note, I would like to say, um, in Sipedi we say, which basically means that feel free and welcome and enjoy the launch. Thank you. first part of this murals comes from. So he studied at Northwest University where he obtained his PhD in biochemistry coupled with chemistry um, and then he came and then he went to the CSIR where he started working. Um, afterwards he then did a postdoc, a postdoctoral um, research study in North Carolina and the USA. Um, and then he moved to the UFS um, and he has been here since then. So Gary also asked that this is not science so the CV should stay aside, but Gary is uh, is a NRF rated scientist. He's got um, more than 75 publications, so he's well versed in the scientific field as well. But then, um, oh, I have to mention that he worked initially on um, snake toxins, snake venom, and then he changed to enzymes in food. It was quite a change. <laughs> um, so. Gary is an interesting person because as a scientist, what we normally do, we sit in our office, talk, 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 go to the lab, work, 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 go home, talk, 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 and that's that. But Gary is, I told him the other day when he told me about the book, that he's most likely the most balanced person that I've ever met. Because apart for, for science, he restored a Jeep for doing 4x4 four four stuff. Um, he is big with guns, I know. Um, and in July, he was part of the South African team that um, participated, I think it was in the 17th, um, Silhouette World Championship in Sweden. And then he wrote the book. So Gary, um, congratulations with the book. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about the book. So then also then to introduce the moderator of this um, session, um, this is Dr. Neil Cronier, he's an oncologist, but he's also, now I need the glasses and the pronunciation, um, a philanthropic specialist, um, you know, I have a colleague that has this thing of putting the emphasis on the wrong saliva. <laughs> so this is what I'm doing now, I can see my wife goes, ooh. Um, so he's right that a distinguished philatelist in South Africa and an experienced internationally recognized jazz, judge um, of philatelic collections. So, Dr. Neil, over to you. Thank you. 
I hope you don't mind if I sit. Yeah, I'm a philatelist. Uh, that's uh, uh, something that very few people know these days. The first uh, post office in South Africa was in Mossel Bay, or call, previously called Oliverville South. This was a stone and it was followed by a booth that was hanged in, the, in a milk, um, milk wood tree. And whenever the ships passed uh, uh, Mossel Bay, or at that stage, Alibel South, they went to the boot, removed the uh, letters, replaced it with letters back to Europe or wherever they want to send it, and took it to the next post. This was the first post office in South Africa. Soon afterwards, post offices started in Cape Town. And it was a stone, and they put the uh, letters under the stone, and it's marked. And if you go to some of the museums in Cape Town, you'll find some of these stones there. And it's still possible to find stones um, lying around somewhere that we don't know about. The post offices became more and more common in South Africa and this resulted in the major expansion of the postal services in South Africa. Now, today you send emails or WhatsApps or whatever you want to send. The post office was so effective that if you send a postcard to your friend on the other side of town in the morning and you invite him for dinner tonight, he will probably reply by two o'clock and send the postcard back because there were up to six postal deliveries in towns at that stage. Now, the post office is expanded all over the place and it became a boring place but a very important place and i would like to know from professor astrop you named your book the post office murals of south africa what is this book about because it's not about steps <laughs> you're right now, can we just have the uh, presentation Right, these murals are paintings on ceramic tiles and they were mounted on buildings, specifically government buildings. And most of them were mounted on post office offices. These uh, murals were produced at a ceramic factory in Olifantsfontein, which was called the Ceramic Studio. And uh, these murals were manufactured between 1930 and 1940. So uh, that's what those murals are. Now, why on this earth did you decide to write something about these items? Uh, I grew up, as you heard, I grew up in Paris, and Paris has this on the on the right, left hand side has this beautiful bond brick building which was erected in 1937. And this building has no less than six murals which decorate the walls. And uh, uh, if you look at that mural at the bottom, there's this red mail delivery vehicle. When I was a child, I liked that vehicle very much because I had a collection of uh, toy cars, old timers, and I would have really liked to remove those tiles to put together with my toys. Luckily, I didn't manage to do that. Uh, so that nowadays, uh, it's, I appreciate them uh, even more. Then, uh, through my travels, I at once, when I come to small towns, I don't just pass, I drive through the small towns. And when I, at one stage, drove through Dordrecht, something caught my eye. And it was murals on the Dordrecht post office. So I stopped and photographed them. 
And uh, I thought, well, that's interesting. There must perhaps be others. And very later on, I learned about more post offices that were decorated with uh, these murals. And because Let's I'm a, a collector of things, I thought that might be a very nice thing to collect as a photographic record of the murals on the post offices. Now, what motivated to, you to write the book? I, I see the daughter post office is the one on the right, and I can see the two murals on the side. I know the post office very well, as you know, and yes. I really enjoy looking at it. But what motivated you to write this book? Um, when I started with the uh, well, when I continued with the photographic record, well, that is what I meant. The murals are placed on the outside walls of these buildings, so they're exposed to the environment. And uh, while well, they're human-made, they can't, la can't last forever. And this is what met me. The uh, glazing of the uh, tiles can crack. The walls of the building can crack, which may crack the, the tiles. They may fall off. Um, in this case, at the uh, right, you can see that the that uh, tile is broken and the pieces have been remounted on the wall. Unfortunately, the one in the middle, the tile is gone, and that is uh, my beloved Paris, one of those. Um, or they, the tiles fell off and they've been remounted, but not in the right position. So that made me uh, realize that. Uh, these these buildings or these should be recorded before these arts are, uh, are lost. Uh, another thing is that the uh, times are changing. The uh, buildings no longer fulfill their purpose, and the post office had to make a plan: either refurbish the building or demolish the building and replace it by another one. And in those cases, there's no record of, uh, we know of at least three of such buildings which have been demolished or refurbished, and the, the, these tile uh, artworks are gone. They're, they're lost forever. Yeah, uh, if you're looking for that tile there in the middle, I know there a, was a boy by the name of Gary that collected these things. We must look out and see if we can't find it. <laughs> No, you were wrong in this instance. I had one. I had a new tile made, so uh, uh, that that, pile, that panel is restored. The um, you mentioned that you focused uh, a lot on the uh, artworks in the book. Who produced these artworks? Who were these people? Uh, at Willy Fons Fontaine, the there was a. a brick and ceramic pottery factory. And this was owned by Sir Thomas Cullinan. Uh, I think the factory started around about 1904, but by 1914 they went out of business because they couldn't keep up with the uh, import uh, competition. And by 1925 there was a lady, Marjorie Johnston, that approached the Cullinans uh, to open a, a pottery studio and uh, she was joined by uh, another um, lady with the surname Short. They were both properly trained artists in ceramics. They were trained at the Durban School of Art but also uh, in London at the uh, School of Art in London. So they recruited a couple of other um, artists and at some stage they were commissioned to uh, produce ceramic tiles for the Parkmore station in Johannesburg. Now the top Parkmore station in Johannesburg was also uh, decorated, or another artist who participated was the well-known Pirniev. And some Pirniev paintings decorated that station. And the uh, tiles that they produced were of the Spanish colorful tiles, Spanish tile, uh, and also the Delft blue with some designs in it. Um, 
they, they, this project basically made them visible and the uh, government art architect uh, Clayland, he recruited these uh, artists to produce more panels for government buildings which were designed. And uh, these buildings were all built between 1930 and 1940. And uh, uh, yeah, as I said, Clayland recruited them. And in the end, there were more than 10 of the artists working on the ceramics uh, artworks. For the post offices, uh, there were nine people that I could trace that work for the panels that were decorating post offices. I think it's uh, important to understand that some uh, of these artists work on post office and some on other government buildings and you cut the between those two, you draw a line, eh? Yes. You just looked at the post office. Yes. Um, are these artworks just nice pictures so, or is there another reason why they were produced and why were they put up on specific post offices? Uh, the artworks, everyone has a specific theme and the themes were well researched by the artists. So there's nature, there's anthropology, there's history, there's technology. And uh, when I visited, uh, did I it was important for me that I visited those places because I could now experience the environment of the town, the environment of the uh, area, the district, and so on, to understand those artworks. And if one looks at these artworks on their own, it hardly makes sense. But, uh, and that is what why I decided uh, when I, this doesn't make sense that in my book I have to find some order. Well, I'm a scientist, we have to order things, no? And uh, I, I realized that actually they put, it is a beautiful illustration of South Africa's history. So put in sequence, we can start off at the left with nature. Then with the indigenous Africa, the people who came from the north and settled in South Africa. This is, is then followed by, a, at a later stage, by Europeans who tried to find a route around the Cape for the trade route to Asia. The settlement at the Cape, then uh, movement by pioneers to the inland, um, missionary and teaching uh, development, uh, conflict and wars between various groups and eventually also there's uh, uh, discovery of diamonds and gold and the development of industry and also the technological in, uh, development of agriculture. Another theme is the uh, technological development of transport, specifically the transportation that served the, the mail uh, delivery. The um, history of South Africa is well illustrated here. However, we know that some of these uh, murals are also sort of an in-between phase where you're unsure of what is actually happening there. For example, the Dordrecht Post Office. And I don't know if you will probably speak about it a little bit later on. Um, the graphics is absolutely beautiful in this book. Some, I showed the book to somebody recently and they said, oh, I would love to have it. My tear some pages out. I said, no. <laughs> because she wants to frame the pages, but uh, it is absolutely beautiful. What is your source? Actually, let me just comment on this one um, before I answer your question. Let me just comment on this. I've been informed by uh, ceramic artists that it is very difficult to put detail on ceramics. Um, but these artists managed to, with a few brush strokes, to get facial expressions. Look at this one at the bottom. Uh, textile, textile detail. 
if we look at the right, but also botanical detail. And we were able to, with the help of a colleague at the botany, botany department, to identify most of these plants. So they, they did great effort to do their research and to produce this detail. Now, uh, I think we are a bit in, out of sequence. <laughs> Uh, what was your question again? The, uh, I was asking you about the, uh, the, um, the graphics in the book uh, oh. that uh, so well illustrated that yeah. I wanted to know about your source. Well, firstly, if I can show some more of the uh, uh, artists. Here are two artists that produce more of the, more than one mural. And if we look at the top pictures, they are really beautiful, the layout, the design, the, the composition, the, you can feel the movement and the depth. Whereas the same artist uh, uh, produced the ones at the bottom, they, those artworks look a bit amateurish, isn't it? And the movement is stiff. And uh, it seems as if they, they gained experience over time. The top ones are of a, a later production. Um, have we missed a... Can we just go back? One, two... No, I think I've, I'm a bit confused now. Go forward. One more. Yeah, that one. All right. At the, I wasn't the only person who was interested in these murals. So... Uh, of course, when you're a collector, you want to finish quickly. And I thought I could get some photographs from people that are also interested in this. Uh, but as you can see, uh, the idea of what is quality photography isn't the same for everyone. Uh, photos taken at an angle or with a flash burst in the middle, that is not uh, acceptable. Uh, some of these panels are very large. And if you take one photograph of this large panel and you would like to get detail and enlarge it, well, what do you get? Some blurred image. So uh, the uh, solution was to, to photograph them in sections and have them realigned later. And fortunately, uh, we're in modern times. This is with the electronic help of Photoshop and uh, the like programs. Uh, this is possible, and my friend Zayn, I indebted to him, he's an expert on that. And uh, he went through the trouble of aligning and get the color and the light intensity and everything right, so that one would not be able to um, tell the, the difference that they were se separate pictures at some stage. I, don't, I hope I don't pick it up your system again now, but I would like to know, if I look at the pictures that you're showing us now, some of these murals are more lifelike than others. Is it the different artist, or was it the time, or uh, uh, fashion, or why are these items so different? Uh, can we go back? Um, another one? that one. As I, there were nine artists that produced murals. Uh, some only produced one. So they one cannot really draw conclusions on the skills or the experience of the artist. But uh, as I said in these uh, two examples here, the top ones produced were produced later than the bottom ones. And one can see there is definitely a degree of improvement of skills and artistic design, isn't it? So you, you think it's a question of the day, it sort of became better over time? Yes. And of course, each one of these artists, I only have these two examples here, but each one has a different style. Um, especially if you look at the ones who only produced one panel, one, one artwork, you can see the difference definitely. Each one has a personal uh, style that he was using, he or she was using. Now, these post offices are not all downtown. 
They scattered throughout the country. How long did it take you to take all these photos? Uh, another one. There. Well, there you see the map where these uh, post offices are. They're scattered throughout the country. If you would like to uh, go on a single tour, it'll be two and a half or more thousand kilometers. And, uh, well, to take a photograph, visit the post office and take a photograph, that takes a few minutes. But uh, in some instances, you have to do your homework because you might not be there at the right time of the day and you will have a beautiful shadow halfway uh, uh, cast over that uh, um, picture or that artwork and that's not desirable. So then you have to spend a couple of more hours in, in one town to get the lighting right. So what I did is I um, made some, I took normal uh, usual tours or uh, if it's was for work purposes or sporting trips or holidays, I designed the, planned the route such that I made some detours and get to these post offices. So to visit them all took me uh, about seven years. <laughs> well, I'm sure you have some heartwarming memories of your tours. Yeah. Now, um, which one is your favorite post office? Or your favorite mural, what would you like to call it? <laughs> well, it's, uh, um, uh, which is your favorite child? <laughs> you, have, you have four. <laughs> uh, each one of these post offices, uh, there's some uh, a special connection with. Either the people that I met there, or the people that were with me, or uh, stories around the uh, murals. But uh, if you page one more, um, go one more. There, this one of Parais brings back many good memories. I grew up in that Fall River, not on it, in it. <laughs> and uh, it brings back many good memories. I still experienced in my youth the uh, pontoon, where things were transported from one side to another side, where there were no bridges available. Now, looking at these photographs that you've illustrated, some of the plants appear from a different era. For example, some might be an aloe, but if I see that, I think it's algarve. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, is this uh, just the poor quality of um, artist, or is it... Um, uh, that uh, it, it happens to be like that. Oh. As I mentioned here, the detail is quite good. But uh, on these, some of these uh, uh, artworks, of course, the artists use their artistic freedom. On um, one, for instance, at uh, Furisberg, there's the mountain landscape at the background, and the artist managed to move a mountain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> decided that the natural position to the right is not quite fit and moved that mountain to the center. Um, so in some cases they made some mistakes, especially for instance one of the trains, there are some wheels missing. If you go back into the uh, old photographs of the original trains, you can see that model is missing wheels there. And with the plants it is similar. For instance, the detail of the protea and the daisy and uh, aloes and so it is excellent. But if you look at the right hand picture, that is definitely a prickly pear. And the, uh, uh, the complete panel is the pioneers, it depicts the pioneers of the 1750s. And prickly pears were only brought to South Africa after around uh, 1880. So there's a time uh, problem. But I mean, who of you know that the aloe, the agave and the uh, prickly pears are, we just know them as wild plants. But who knows that they are actually not South African plants. So the, uh, uh, we can forgive those artists for that mistake, can't we? <laughs> 
On the left, uh, uh, I see there's some strelitzias, uh, and it's highly unlikely that that aloe will occur with the strelitzias. Exactly, that's a, um, an ecological mistake, not just a botanical <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, on some of the murals, it appears that there's been some repairs. A line sort of are not in line. They sort of, one is the part of the line is higher than the other. Is this common and who did the repairs? Was it done later on? I have no idea. Yeah, I, this is not, there's not quite an example of that. Well, so two of them that I visited, one could see that the, uh, there were some repairs done because the tile is broken and pieces were put back. Um, then there are some uh, where the, you can see that a certain tile doesn't really fit. For instance, uh, um, there's a row of chairs on the one the chairs have a certain size and on the other, uh, going on the next tile, they have a very long uh, back and that shows that there were some replacements. But because I think those were due to breakages during transport of the tiles from the factory to the uh, uh, site of mounting back then because those were reproduced by the factory, those tiles. Uh, it is not that the two instances that I had tiles made, they really don't, they also don't really fit if you really look at them, but uh, we did our best. Now, what about the future? Are you bringing out another book on the murals of the post, of the uh, uh, stations? Um, and, and I want another one, and I go forward. Or the post offices, there were, at, there were 25 that I recorded, there were a couple more, as I've mentioned. Uh, there are other government sectors, government buildings, which were also decorated. Uh, the one in the middle is the uh, Paddington Children's Hospital in Durban. Beautiful uh, three-dimensional tiles. The one at the right hand side, that is the uh, children's hospital at Grote Skier, or children's ward. Uh, the one at top is the magistrate court in Port Elizabeth. And the two at the left, I do not really know which government buildings there are. One is in Pretoria and one is in Polokwane. Uh, to my knowledge, there are uh, less than 10 other um, murals on other buildings than the post offices. Uh, so there was no other sector that uh, really made use of these murals to decorate the buildings. Uh, these were just some odd ones. So no, uh, there won't be another book on uh, railways or police stations or something like that. It's not possible. <laughs> If, if we can go back one or two slides, just see another one, another one, another one. Oh, that, that, that one. That post office on the left top. Um, can you explain to us what's going on there? Uh, that is the, uh, one of the people the other day said to me, I, I, mean, I recognize that building, that is Lusiki Siki in the Eastern Cape. Now, uh, there is a postcard with the photograph of the original post office. And uh, this is one of the cases where the post office had to be refurbished to fit uh, uh, newer demands. And uh, yeah, the murals, one can see them next to the, let me show it to you there. There and there, there are the murals, they're gone. They're lost. No one knows what those pictures are. So people of the Eastern Cape, if you have photographs, please bring them. <laughs> uh, go to the next one. Uh, may I just say something about the picture right top? That appears to be a reasonably modern one. That is not that modern. It was also of 1950s and it was in Florida. I got it from, I got the picture from someone 
and uh, with the note that it's from Florida post office and he doesn't even know from whom he got the uh, picture but it is not no longer in that post office. The reason why I'm saying it, it looks like a modern one is the airmail stamp on it. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was in Chicago some years ago, I was visiting Chicago for Congress and there was, uh, on the shore, there was a museum. And this museum contained uh, lead glass windows. It came out of buildings that they demolished in Chicago and they put all these windows together and produced the museum, a beautiful place. Do you think the local population in South Africa of the different towns appreciate these murals enough? And can we let them look after these murals for the future? Or do you think we need to remove them and place them in a museum? Oh, that is quite a tough question. Um, let me go to the next slide. Yeah, that one. <clears throat> At least four people to whom I spoke that grew up alongside these decorated post offices, they said that they really that they really take note of these artworks. They after all, they've been there for 60 years, and they might be still be there in, to eternity. Um, so it seems as if the locals do not really care. And then the other thing is that uh, the demographics of South Africa has changed. What was acceptable in the 1930s as beautiful art and representing something is not the case anymore. At uh, two instances, I was, in, I was told that the people would rather like these murals removed. But uh, as I said, um, if you look at them loose, they don't make sense. But when one puts them in sequence, you have an illustration of the history of South Africa. And then actually time and design and so on wouldn't matter. But uh, to my mind, I think the the current owner, the government, is not the, the right uh, one who would look after them. I saw two post offices that were reallocated to different, uh, to different newer de other departments, government departments. The one building is not really looked after. The other one in Ishawi, that became the mayor's suite, and really sweet. They, it is, immaculate condition. I really liked that visit there and to, to speak to the, the people. Unfortunately, the mayor wasn't there. Uh, these three buildings are also not post offices anymore. They are in private, the private property now. The one is a, a, a house where people live in. Um, the others is a, a shop, a coffee shop and a, um, an antique shop and of course these people take ownership of these buildings and they care for them and they will they look after these um in on the way to a lady brunt there's a sign marseilles turning to the left uh, the last time i saw that building or the previous time i saw the building was uh, uh, it was doubled up as a shop and a post office or postal service and the last time I visited it last year it was um, deserted and left to the termites to decay it so that is in a sad state so it might just be worth the while to have someone remove them some museum or something to place them in a museum yes I would suggest that you donate one of these books to the monument commission and I'm sure that when they see this, they'll pick it up and follow it up. Because they look at do them. that type of things. Are there any questions? Anybody with that would like to make comments? Um, uh, uh, the state architect, uh, Clayland was his name. Uh, he was the head of the architectural yeah, of the gov architects of the government. And 
the way I see it is that the the intention was to decorate several state or government buildings, but I I think I didn't go into detail. Maybe Jan Ras can help us here. Um, there was a uh, the need for post offices in the 1950s, so many were built in that time. I don't know about what, police buildings and other government buildings were they also springing up during those years. Okay, but it seems as if only the post offices were interested in um, making more use of these panels to decorate their uh, buildings than the other um, sectors. Fireplaces also like this murals, also drawn in um, 1951, 1950, 41. Yes, you, you are right. Uh, that is one of the ones which I haven't visited yet. So I don't have photographs of that. Um, but uh, it's, it's on my bucket list. <laughs> You said that the, all the artists had their styles in a way, but was there a certain um, theme besides the history that you noticed that they tried to keep within each of the murals? The murals, sorry. And then, um, with the artist that you, the artists that you traced, you said nine. Are any of them still alive right now? And right now as you published the book, and um, was there any limitation with regard to what part of the history they can actually put within the, um, the art pieces that they created? Thank you, those are interesting questions. Uh, 1930s, that will be um, 90 years ago, and if those artists were 20 or 30, they would be 100 or 110, <laughs> so no, there's, there's no one alive now. Um, your, okay, where are you, where are you from? Kalanchu. If you, uh, I'll put a, a cut out of uh, a Zulu dancer there. If you go to um, the Fudisberg, the there are two panels on the uh, Soto culture, beautiful. It shows the, the early and later architecture, the clothing, the dress, uh, and also the food uh, that they, you must really have a visit there, that it's beautiful. Uh, this one in KwaZulu uh, Natal, there's two panels, one is of a, a wedding, or perhaps both are of a wedding, where the one is the dancers of the, the girls and the other one is the dancers of the men. In uh, Elliot Dale, Eastern Cape, there's a, a, on the uh, Koza, the dress, the, the hairdo, everything, it, it's beautiful artworks. Um, the, uh, uh, if you go to Tabanju, past the bunch of go to my sales there uh, I showed this blue one that is a conflict of the uh, uh, one of the, the eight seven or eight wars in the Eastern Cape at Tabanchu there's two panels where it shows the conflicts the one between the British and the Sutus with King Moshweshwe there and uh, what I find interesting is that that panel shows the peace uh, uh, negotiation. And actually, the Sutus thrashed the, the British. They gave them a hiding, but they didn't know it. Ooh, I like that, the British getting a hiding. Um, and the other one is between the Free State uh, of Boers and the, the Sutu, also some negotiation process going on there. Okay, whether there was a limitation on the themes, uh, the one at the bottom is uh, mail transport, modern at that time, a post office, there's a, the nose of a train, a speed train, uh, steamship, which was modern in the 1950s. So uh, 
or whether there's a limitation, it seems as if there was, was free whatever, but they took what, uh, what was authentic to the town or the area to represent on these uh, uh, murals. And that's what makes it so special. So this post office, which is just a building, now got something which is from the area and now it becomes a true citizen of that town. So to me that is, was quite beautiful. If I might comment on that uh, peace negotiations, the one thing that is uh, wonderful about that uh, specific mural is that you can actually see that it is Moss Mushesh the first. Yeah, you can recognize his facial expression and his dress, that it is that specific man. It's not just a black man standing there. It is Mushesh. It's really a very good piece of art. Any more questions or any more answers? Also mentioned, I noticed that Lesotho was not included, obviously it's not in South Africa, but um, with that fuchsia book, would you think that maybe um, Lesotho could be maybe a, a, a place that you could also explore um, since its history was also kind of, it also kind of melted within the South African history? Uh, if you can tell me if, that, if there are any buildings in Lesotho which have been decorated with uh, these ceramic tile panels. Yes, I will go and visit it. But uh, I'm not the only one who is interested in it. So there are other people who also did some footwork. And all the uh, government buildings which bear these ceramic tiles have been recorded. Um, I basically compiled well, consolidated that and went out to make to get good pictures. And uh, yeah, so I don't know of any buildings in Lesotho which were. Um, uh, it's an interesting question because during the 1930s, it was uh, it was still Commonwealth, and uh, there was some support from South Africa uh, to these uh, to the neighboring countries. But uh, no record of this. The post offices of uh, Lesotho uh, at that time, Basotho land, was still using the South African stamps, for example, till 1933. So it's quite possible that there can be some murals there that we don't know about. And uh, it will be very interesting if we can find out about that. Any more answers without enough questions? I, I got to call a few mentions. So the, the, the three missing post office. Yes. The one is the Lesotho City, the other two, Kumbu and uh, Inkeleni, um, Eastern Cape. And uh, the latest friend of mine looked at my book and said, Oh, that looks familiar. Boxburg. And he Googled, and there's no more old post office. There's a, a new red brick post office. So there's a fourth one that we now know is gone. I think uh, to all of this, no more questions for your attendance. Um, I hope that this. Uh, will be discussed in the art department here. It's something totally different from the modern material. So I hope you will make contact with them and show them around. Thank you. Thank you all. Can we go to the last slide? <laughs> At this stage, I would like to call Hesma because I, um, when I made this, when I compiled this book, 
friend of mine. Uh, he's, a, he's retired now and uh, he's an anthropologist and a, uh, what's it, what he studied, a journalist. And uh, he mentioned that this will become, uh, this is immediately Africana. So I was quite chuffed. So I contacted Esma and she brought me in contact with Wilda and uh, well, the rest is history. So this book is now going to be taken up in the uh, collection of the corner. I think you must uh, speak a bit more now. Thank you. Yeah, and we're going to have a coffee in Africana, especially the coffee on our books, and of course your coffee as well. So, but it's it's the in Africana protected collection. But I think we must buy a coffee just for the for the open shelves as well. Thank you very much. Okay, then I would just like to say some words of thanks. Uh, firstly, to Chris Albertain, of Chris Albertain, for introducing me and the facilitator. Then, uh, Dr. Neil Cronier, facilitator. Very thank thanks a lot for your time and your uh, questions and preparation. Then, for that team there, I just know Marcus, but I see Marcus has many hands. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. It's, you did a great job here. Um, then to Zane, who is the uh, graphic designer. He made my dream. I had a, a castle in the air and he painted it. <laughs> so that's how I can describe it. And then to my uh, wife, Sonia, over there. She's handling the sales of the book. <laughs> If you're interested in buying, there are some books available for buying. We also have the card facilities. And for everyone who's here, thank you very much. It made my day. Thank you for the question. Thank you.